Good morning, Mastermind friends. It's great to have you with us for a monthly Mastermind call. This morning, I have with me Shelly Van Epps. Many of you have met her, fellow coach, and Shelly and I have uh, been together for a few years now. We've known each other for a long time, haven't we, Shelly? Yes, we have. It's like <laughs> <laughs> Shelly, I can't even think back when. <laughs> I know it's been 15 years ago or something. But mm-hmm. Shelly is an awesome team leader uh, for a, a wonderful practice in Michigan, and she's been working with um, several clients lately. So it's great to have her on the team. You've probably met her at the retreats, and so we're going to talk about a favorite, all-time favorite dental conversation, which is <laughs> cancellations. Dun dun dun. Yeah. So um, we thought we would just mastermind between the two of us and things that we've seen and things we're seeing and things that can work. Um, Shelly, we talked yesterday on a coaching call that, you know, there's just no magic bullet for this, is there? No, there's not. Everybody's practice is is unique and that's okay. It's just taking these different tips and ideas and trying to figure out which one works best for you and evaluating yourselves. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I wish there was a magic bullet. I think yesterday you said you wish that you would be the one to create that magic yes. bullet. <laughs> We'd be rich, wouldn't we? <laughs> exactly. Be everybody's hero if we can create mm-hmm. the magic bullet. But, you know, some people really look to the front and they blame all the cancellations on the person who's answering the phone. And that's not really fair because I'm like, why did they believe they could call and cancel anyway? I mean, what gave them the idea that it was okay? Um, yeah. So sometimes we teach our patients to do that, and we don't realize it. Yeah. A lot of times I know I've been one of those at the front desk that starts to feel the pressure of, oh, my goodness, what am I supposed to do to help keep these appointments? And really when it comes down to it, you have to look at the full picture and what have we done to build that value for the patient to begin with. And like right. you said, why do they think it's okay for them to treat us that way and to cancel on us or – you know, to have other things be their priority. we that, that lands on us, both at the front, but also in the clinical aspect as well. That's right. It does. Very, very much so. So today we want to cover five areas. Um, evaluating your current reality. Uh, what's my problem? And relationships and trust. Building value, as Shelly just mentioned, and presentation of treatment. So mm-hmm. let's see if we can cover these here in a few minutes and um let's talk about evaluating the current reality what are some ways you do that well it it starts with that feeling a lot of times people will will hear doctors or team members say man everybody is canceling everybody is canceling and when you look at it you need to really have an idea of what that means because what feels like is happening isn't always the case <laughs> that's um, true <laughs> Until you start putting it on paper. And so I know a lot of team members kind of sigh or get frustrated when we say you're going to need to track that because it adds an extra step. But really, you don't know where you need to focus if you don't know what's truly happening. So um, come back to my tracking (laughs) again. And and I used to be one of those team members who would sigh when we'd say, okay, we're going to have to track that because it is an extra step. But um, really, there's there's the three different things that happen. We have people who cancel, and then we have people who reschedule, and then we have those that are no showing completely and not even right. reaching out to us. So um, those holes in the schedule, what's what's really happening? Were the holes there to begin with? Yeah. Um, you know, and and that's what a lot of times the doctors or the hygienists will feel like. Oh, my whole schedule fell apart. Well, sometimes it's that it wasn't filled to begin with. That's the um, yeah. <laughs> So we have some extensive ways to track if people want to, and they usually only do that for a short amount of time because it is very time-consuming. If you want to know how many were open at the beginning of the day, how many Mm -hmm. uh, canceled, how many were we able to recover, because sometimes all the admin team can get done during the day is refill the schedule. So uh, then you may wonder, why didn't they get anything else done? But exactly. um, I think one of the things, like you said, sometimes it feels like things are falling apart and maybe they aren't. Like we were talking recently to someone who thought that this particular hygienist um, had more cancellations. Well, actually, it was another hygienist who had more than the other. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's where that feeling a lot of teams will say, oh, well, they're all rescheduling and then they start tracking it and it comes down to not necessarily the case. Exactly. And so um, and then the reasons why they're canceling or rescheduling, you know, a lot of times mm-hmm. we'll hear it's work, it's they're sick. And when you get down to it, there's no excuse at all or we're not asking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I just can't stress enough that tracking component so that you know where to focus and they even tracking you know one thing we talked about the team retreat and this has come up a few times is tracking your 100 percent attendance days yes i love that (laughs) shift to the positive you know i I remember having a doctor who was just complaining about cancellations i said did you notice how many 100 percent attendance days you had last month and you're like what are you talking about (laughs) Mm -hmm. it is it's such an exciting thing um we actually recently had that happen where the whole team, by the end of the day, I think it was 3 o'clock, they were like, oh, my gosh, we're almost there. It's almost 100%. And, <laughs> and the difference in the energy in the office is mm-hmm. just, you can't even explain it. So if you're not tracking that, I would I would suggest giving it a try because it's it's really exciting <laughs> when you realize yeah, that there absolutely. is positive days. So let us know if you want more ideas about that because we have some ideas on how to make that work. But, okay. Yes. So, yeah. um. I like what what we're saying here about uh, what's their reason. Is this the first time they've done it? Um, mm-hmm. Is it doctor hygiene? Um, yeah, a lot of. T- I mean, that just tells us where to focus. I mean, if it's if it's doctor, a lot of that is ca- could be case presentation. Um, how are we clo- how are we closing the case? How are we building that up? Um, hygiene. Are we giving them a value or a reason to return? Which we can we can get into what that entails um but really you need to know which area you have to focus on before you can really start pointing fingers on there you go it's that girl on the phone she doesn't know how to keep an appointment exactly Um, yeah that's definitely um something most people don't look at they spend more time on handling the phone call than they do on creating mm -hmm. ideas about what's causing you know discovering researching so so um you know, what, what are in the, what's my problem? So we're in section two, um, Mm -hmm. is, you know, what, what do you want to share here about this, the cause and effect? And, uh, you've got reschedule, no shows, lack of urgency. You've got a common theme here that we're dealing with. There's usually about three out of the six objections. Yeah. I, I feel like once, once we really start tracking and this is across the board, I've heard these different things, but when it comes down to it, those reasons that tend to come up fall on the lack of urgency, the lack of trust, and then the finances. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the others are definitely there and we do hear them. And there are some times that we get cancellations where there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Um, Maybe they did have an illness or, you know, they truly do have a work issue, but we can't control those. And this is where we have to stay within our bubble. We talk about that a lot is what can we control? And these are the ones that we hear that we can help control. So um, those are the areas that I like to have teams kind of tweak in and figure out which one of these areas should we be focusing on. Um, and so that's, that, yeah, that's that falls for both cancellations, <laughs> rescheduling, and no-shows. They all tend to to fall into that same area. It it does. It's really interesting. I, I feel like out of the six objections, I mean, we used to say there's five, but I think we found the sixth one. Not <laughs> yes. read that to one of my colleagues, but, but it's um, <clears throat> uh, lack of urgency, money, time, fear, lack of trust, and confusion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some people just really get confused about uh, what am I having done today? I mean, how many times does that happen? And <laughs> not very often, right? <laughs> right. Hopefully not. And and then if we're giving them options in a treatment plan, you know, as we're tracking case presentation and acceptance, we get those questions all the time on the tracker about, well, well, what if we gave them three options? Which one should we count as presented? And I'm like, mm-hmm. you can give people three options, but ideally, you know, which one they're choosing by the questions you're asking. Um, exactly before they leave so you don't just hand somebody three options and walk out um, without kind of knowing where they're going and that comes in case presentation conversation of presenting the benefits not just the features so um and you know 
I guess we should save this story, but remind remind me to come back to that story that um, Jeff shared with us. Remember Jeff? At yes. The street? That mm-hmm. was pretty powerful. Yep. So um, on relationships and trust, uh, you know, how does that come into a cancellation conversation? Well, I, I feel like if if you have – one of your best friends or a family member, you're more likely to value their time and to want to go and see them. And so not that it's necessarily a time for completely just hanging out with a friend, but you want them to feel like they're getting to see their friend that they only have the opportunity to see a couple of times a year. Mm -hmm. And for them to be excited about that, um, I've asked, you know, would you say hi to your patient if you walked by in the grocery store and I've been asked, well, isn't that a HIPAA violation? And, you know, it's not its not necessarily that I want you to go up and say, hey, did you have your crown done? Or did you go and see that specialist and have your root canal done and announce it to the store? It's no. just a matter of, I know you, you know me, and hi, how are you doing? You know, and you don't have to talk about how you know them out in public. But Exactly. A lot of times they'll know that they recognize you, but they don't recognize you completely because you don't have a mask and loops. And yeah. Everything on. So and you've got, got regular clothes on. Yeah. Exactly. But even if they don't acknowledge it and they don't recognize, is it such a bad thing to just say hi to somebody? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's a bad thing. And if they no. did recognize you, then that's just that much more, um, you know, of a tie that you have that they realize, oh, my gosh, she knows who I am. Well, it Um, goes back to that law of research. Um, You know, the more you know about them, the more they think you know what you're doing. Yes. And and you can sit down, you can take x-rays and talk to a patient, you know, well, not with with the film in their mouth, but in between and things and get to know them so that you know personal things about them and be interested, not just interesting. You don't have to just talk about yourself the whole time. Um, and that's, that's actually something that's hard for some people to do, yes. especially us I personality people. Oh, I know. <laughs> to, to twist it, to talk about them, but. Well, it um, creates a loyal patient versus a satisfied patient and I have a little talk I do on that sometimes. You know, what would you rather have, a loyal patient or a satisfied patient? Um, mm-hmm. I think sometimes, as you well know, Shelly, you can you can have someone come in and dentistry is a commodity to them. It's like, well, I can get this cleaning anywhere. A cleaning is a cleaning or a crown is a crown. And mm-hmm. they may be satisfied with the service that day, but are they coming back? Are they loyal? Um, exactly. So relationships and building trust, are huge pieces of of creating that loyal patient. Exactly. And, and, and starting what, right with that new patient of, mm-hmm. you know, getting to know them that first time. We talk about this a lot of that initial interview with the patient and getting to know what their goals are, but also getting to know them as a person. Yeah. Um, that's just huge. It There's no... <laughs> that's the most important five minutes that you might take of your day is to sit down and get to know that person on a personal level um, because longevity for that person to stay within your practice is that's the foundation of it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you start to build that trust and especially if they've come from a dentist office that maybe either told them that they needed a lot of things that they didn't believe or the opposite, maybe oh, yeah. they weren't told anything, and you're about to find a catastrophic event <laughs> inside of their mouth. Um, oh, yeah. You, If you start this before you ever even look in their mouth, um, that's huge because they start to build, you start to build that trust right off the bat. Exactly. That is, um, you know, that's where that sticker shock comes in and the second mm. opinion and all of that. When we have not connected, um, I was sharing with the doctor this week about connecting. When I first started public speaking, I was taught the data is the most important. Make sure you get all of the data shared. Well, that would be our treatment plan, you know. <laughs> right. Let's make sure we get all of that treatment plan um, shared and then When I went to like two or three speaking courses, they all said, um, no, connecting with the audience or connecting with the person or in this case, connecting with the patient is the number one thing because they're not going to be listening to your data if you haven't connected with them. 
Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, asking all of those questions and getting to know them, sharing with them, helping them connect with you is mm-hmm. is critical. Absolutely. You know, and that's even a good idea for ten, uh, dentists and team members to do some public speaking. Um, oh, I hadn't thought of that. You know, I mean, I, I have thought of that, but. I've done a little bit of that for doctors in the past, some public speaking training. Maybe we should do that at the next leadership retreat, Shelly. Yeah, that would be fun. (laughs) No? And everybody's going, no. Everybody's listening. Yeah, everybody's like, oh, I'm not coming. (laughs) um, Shelly just went through the Maxwell, John Maxwell um, certification program, and that was part of your training. It was. um, Very exciting. It is very exciting. So. Okay, um, next section. Oh, boy, this is a biggie. Section four it is, a biggie. is building value. I mean, we could go on for days talking about this. Yeah, the biggest thing, well, maybe not the biggest, but a catapult into that is to, before you ever even head into building the value of what you're about to do, is asking permission and getting the patient to acknowledge that, yes, they want to know what you might find in their mouth. Mm-hmm. So, um I, I like to kind of use the example of if you were having headaches and you went to the neurologist and they decided to take an MRI or CAT scan and they found what was likely the, the culprit of the pain, mm-hmm. but they also happened to find maybe a couple of other concerns or a couple of other um, tumors or cysts, would you want to just know the one that was causing the pain or would you like to know that there were others there as well? Exactly. Um, and, <clears throat> And just give them the choice of, do you want to know everything? Right. And this goes into, you mentioned Jeff in his situation, um, to some extent, and, and his choice was taken away. And that came down to more the the treatment side. But your patients deserve the choice of what they would like to do and to be in control of that and allowing them to decide, do they want to hear everything? That's um, that's such a huge um, piece of this that most people leave out. It's so simple, but they leave mm-hmm. it out. And there's really two parts. Like you said, the, the first part is, do you want to know everything I'm seeing? And mm-hmm. let the patient verbalize that. And it also helps us because yes. many of us as dental team members are approval addicted because we know the patients don't want to be there. They don't like coming to the dentist for the most part. And so we're just like, oh, we don't want to upset them. And we need to hear them say they want to know it all, not just the worst one. And then you feel obligated to tell them everything. Yes. (laughs) You're going around. You're not just going, oh, I'm going to skip that. And then the second part, the second part is the freedom of choice, freedom to choose. You know, if you want to do the treatment, fine. If you want to do some of it, that's all right with us. If you want to do none of it, that's okay with us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not okay with us, but we'll <laughs> respect we'll your it. decision. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Yes. So um, now that we've asked the their permission, now we move into the exam. And the biggest thing is to involve your patient in your exam Mm -hmm. and not to just lay them back and rattle off things and let them lay there wondering, but to include them and explain things to them, show them what you're seeing, um, ask them questions along the way. And a lot of doctors do parts of this. Maybe they do, you know, they'll tell them what they're going to do, but they don't explain what they're going to do. They might just say, okay, now we're going to check the health of your gums. Yeah. Um, Instead of, I'm going to check the health of your gums, and these are the numbers that we want to hear. If we hear anything higher, we're going to definitely want to come back and discuss that. And that way the patient is, if they hear four or five or, okay, we have bleeding over here, they know, oh, no, she already told me or he already told me that that's a problem. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Um. So that's that's really important for them to be part of it. It keeps their mind going, even though they can't ask questions because you're in your mouth. They'll ask them afterwards, which is good. Yeah, that's kind of co-discovery. Um, yes. That used to be a buzzword in case presentation a long time ago. And um, then, you know, they may even start asking, oh, no, that's terrible. That sounds bad. You told me that wasn't good. What do, what do we need to do? And it's really Good. You're building urgency. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. Um, your extrovert patients are probably going to say that. Your introverts are probably going to just sit there and grip the chair. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, I don't think this is the time to go into your perio treatment plan. We want to finish the exam, right? Yes. You definitely do not want to combine um, your conditions with your treatment recommendations because their mind will start going straight to the financial aspect Mm -hmm. as soon as you recommend anything um, or if they hear those buzzwords of things that they relate to either pain or um, money, they shut off and they stop listening. And you want them to feel the full picture of what you're finding in their mouth. And so we try to avoid those recommendations. And if you do need to, a a lot of team members will say, well, how am I supposed to chart all of that then if he's going around or she's going around and there's recommendations? I can't wait till the end to Mm -hmm. make a treatment plan. It's going to take too much time. Um, If you're on the same page with your team members and they know what you recommend in areas or if you have kind of those behind the scene words of, um, for for program two, or if you want to say a 2740 Very, or mm-hmm, 4341, yep. the patient doesn't necessarily know what all of that means. Mm-hmm. Your team member should know what that means. Exactly. And so you have to work together to come up with those different things that you're going to use um, to right. communicate that along the way. That's a, that's a great way to do it. Um, so, and you can let the patient know, hey, you know, Sally and I are going to be talking. We're going to throw out some Numbers, dental terms, don't worry about understanding what we're saying. We'll go over all of it with you when we're, Mm -hmm. and, but you can still include the, oh my goodness, that's a five, that's a six. How long have you had this infection? And they they always say, what infection? And and then I get this question all the time, Shelly, you probably do too, of, well, what if it's an existing patient and they've been coming here and all of a sudden we start telling them this, they're going to wonder why we didn't tell them before. And I'm like, well, yeah, why didn't you tell them before? No, <laughs> but <laughs> that's a hard one for people. It is something new. So Absolutely. um what do you say when, when it's an existing patient like that? And they say, well, I've never had this before. Well, um, you can use the apology as far as, well, I would like to apologize. Perhaps I haven't explained what we've been doing along the way. This is an area that we've been keeping an eye on. But I would like for you to realize what or to be able to be part of understanding what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, The biggest one I hear, the oral cancer screening, people don't realize that you've ever done it until you say, you know, they know, yeah, they told me to stick my tongue out or they stuck that thing around my tongue and kind of pulled it back forth. And I never knew what they were doing. Um, And it's partly our fault as providers of just not explaining to the patient what they're getting so Mm -hmm. they don't value that appointment. And that's a big one during hygiene visits um, that people don't realize that they're getting every time um, is that oral cancer screening. They don't. And And so they think of it as just the cleaning. (laughs) And that's part of that reason to return that we're going to get to. It's, um, you know, it's not, the hygienists are not the cleaning ladies. Y'all hear that out there? You're not the cleaning lady. (laughs) (laughs) You are not just the cleaning lady. But back Um, to the, the, uh, why haven't I heard this before? Why haven't you shared, you know, I didn't know I had become here all the time. I didn't know I had this condition. You know, a lot of times people's conditions change. I like to go to mm -hmm. like medical, you know, did your cholesterol numbers change from the last time you had your exam or your blood pressure, does it change often or have you been under any added stress lately that can affect your gum tissue, medications? medications. You yep. know, I mean, who's going to say no to added stress these days? Exactly. That's so, a good one to lean into. It doesn't have to be like, you know, we've screwed up, we haven't been telling you and we're bad dentists. No, there are things that, that happen and sometimes we have been sort of watching things quietly without letting the patient know, which in my opinion is not a good idea. They, that goes back to the permission statement. They need to be informed of what's going on and let them decide if they want to treat that now or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I know the, the camera helps with this too, doesn't it? Yes. Um, showing them what you're seeing. And a lot of people will take the pictures or they have that <laughs> camera tucked away for emergency situations that, for whatever reason, aren't used on a regular basis. Um, But if you use it, show the patient what you're seeing. 
um, so that they can be involved in that exam. And there's, it, it's literally a thousand word. I mean, you don't have to talk. You see that picture up on the screen and it saves you so much time. Um, even if you're showing them the good things, for example, if it's a hygiene patient and mm-hmm. you've been working really hard with them on their gum disease and you're finding that last time this area was bleeding and now this time it's not bleeding and to show them, hey, you must be doing a good job on your home care in this area. This is looking better. We need to focus on this area. So you're still showing them that there's areas that you need to continue working on. That lower lingual area, right, Paula? Oh, yeah. (laughs) That picture before and after your cleanings. um, It's just helping to build that value of, Mm -hmm. wow, we saw you six weeks ago, or six weeks ago, six months ago, Mm -hmm. and (laughs) cleaned all of this up. And now this is what we're seeing um, in this area here. So that really helps. It does. It does. And I hear that. Uh, team members say, well, I don't have time. We have so much to do in the hygiene visit. I don't have time mm-hmm. to do the camera. I'm like, it's actually going to save you time. It but, is. Like you just said, I mean, if we could just get that, if if I could just have a, a wish in dentistry is that every patient, every visit would have the intraoral, intraoral camera pictures. Mm-hmm. They They I really agree. need to see. And I remember being in your office one time, Shelly, years ago, and um, your Dr. Watterson put up a picture for this patient, and I was in the hallway, and uh, all Dr. Watterson says, what do you think about that up there? And the first thing he says is, is that my tooth? Uh, <laughs> that, they yeah, always think, else's yeah, it's like <laughs> they think we pull out the worst tooth that we've ever seen from somebody else's mouth and put it up there and told them it's theirs. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, that's that's your tooth. What do you think about that? He said, man, looks like I need a crown. <laughs> exactly. There's, that's what, if we can get the patient to asking or telling us what they need, I yeah. mean, they may be wrong in what they need, but at least they're asking and they're concerned and they're self, like you said before, co-diagnosing. They know exactly what the problem is and there's yeah. nothing that you can't possibly be wrong if you're showing them the picture, right? Right. It, just exactly. helps them. it comes back to that trust as well of, mm-hmm. okay, I saw it. I know what that tooth looks like. And now it's my choice whether I'm going to fix it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And, and so that's huge. And you were saying something a minute ago that made me think of um, building value and hygiene of actually listing all the things we did. Most of the time mm-hmm. we send them out with three things on their walkout statement or two things if they didn't have x-rays and they're in mm-hmm. words they don't, prophylaxis they don't know what the heck that is right. and, and <laughs> then they've got x-rays uh maybe bite wings and they don't know what a bite wing is really and then mm-hmm. exam and they're thinking man this cost me this much money for two things or three things but yeah, we did there's... way more than that There's definitely an opportunity where you can create fake codes or non-ADA codes to um, bill out. Well, I shouldn't say bill out, but post on their account everything that you did um, because you don't necessarily have to charge extra for it. Um, Some of the codes are true ADA codes and Mm -hmm. we choose not to bill them. So you could use like the oral cancer screening that is an ADA code or CDT code. so you can use that exact code. You just don't necessarily have to charge for it, although mm-hmm. some can and do, like if they have the Valscope, um, yeah. you know, that's an opportunity. Insurance isn't necessarily going to cover it, but it's an opportunity to to utilize that equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, and for them to see that and list, like you were saying, it's huge for them to be able to to see everything and to know. It oh is, um, like the oral hygiene instruction, the tobacco counseling uh, mm-hmm. nutrition counseling, um, you know, blood pressure. We took their blood pressure. <clears throat> we did a head and neck exam or, uh, there's so many things that we're doing that we're not coding out. So that is a value. I, I go back to the grocery store analogy of, um, if I come out of the grocery with three bags and I spent $200, I did not get a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if you bought a TV in one of those. <laughs> Exactly. It was not a good deal. <laughs> right. 
But if I you come out of meat, I guess if yeah. it's a grocery store, <laughs> that that adds up quick. If I come out with ten bags and I spend two hundred dollars, then I don't feel so bad, you know. Right. <laughs> Even if it's a bunch of ramen noodles. <laughs> yeah, and and you know how they do these days? They put one thing in each bag, so mm-hmm. you feel like exactly. you've got all these groceries. But um, that's the same principle in retail. There's so many things in retail that apply to what we do, and most dental team members have never been trained in retail retail some have but but i know you hire a lot of retail people which is awesome because they get that they get that yeah actually majority of our team has come from that setting versus the the dental setting in the past yes. so um they just there's something to be said for knowing how to treat patients and have that customer interaction and building those relationships that's that's trained in that atmosphere and they do a really good job of it. So Yes, I, I have a team member right now who was a manager in retail. She's new to dentistry, and she is closing cases left and right mm-hmm. without ever being trained when the doctor calls her in the room to get it closed, just mm-hmm. based on these things we're talking about here. She has a relationship with them. She connects with them. She builds trust. She mm-hmm. talks about the value. She doesn't know all the fancy dental terms, so she goes straight to the benefit and the value. Exactly. And, and uh, that's that's worked well for for them. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think another thing that you and I both know is important is asking questions. I think we get into tell mode Eeks, yeah. and we lose them. Yeah, it is it is very easy to do. Um especially when we know, oh, my goodness, I have five minutes left and my next patient is here and I've got all this stuff done and I've gone through all of these steps and now I just have to tell them what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the most important part of the entire appointment, and it's a lot of times the part where we just hand it off to somebody else and say, oh, we'll go over this. I know. And it's it's really too bad because it's the way that we, a lot of offices have just set up their – the way that they flow with the patients. And it's something where I would recommend revisiting that (laughs) um, if that's the way that it's being done and you're noticing that it's not being effective. Um, For some people, maybe it is effective. I don't, I don't know anybody that it is, but perhaps Mm -hmm. you're that one Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) that's out there that it is working for and that you're seeing high acceptance. Um, But if you do have to hand it off, that transfer of power is going to be huge of, not just telling them, okay, here's a treatment plan. Will you go over it with them? Or will you get them scheduled for a crown on number two? Yeah. It's more, we've worked really hard on all of these conditions. We need to continue focusing on that. And Betty would like to get scheduled to take care of the cracked tooth on the upper right. Mm-hmm. Is much more effective than she wants to schedule that crown. So. No and um, there's so much about this. We we should do another call just on transfer because it's just the <laughs> dynamics. You've got your body language, mm-hmm. um, you know, the things we say up there. The team member is going typically behind a counter looking at the computer with the admin person, leaving the patient standing out there by themselves. They're talking dentalese or the patient even walks up by themselves sometime because we're running late. And and why in the world, I mean, you know, we talked at the team retreat we just did on cross-training and seamless team. Why in the world the most important time of the appointment is getting that commitment for the next step? And we turn mm-hmm. that over to someone who wasn't even in the conversation. Right. I know that right. the norm in dentistry, but like you were saying, Shelly, it doesn't work. Yeah, it, it really, unfortunately, does not. It would be nice if it did, but yeah. that's where we have to go back and look and see what other ways can we do this within yeah. our practice to allow um, allow us to finish getting that commitment as a clinician, um, you know, as the hygienist or the doctor or the assistant, because we talk about who they perceive as the most knowledgeable, powerful person in the office, mm-hmm. it's most definitely not that person at the front desk. No. And and we're putting the most important step in the entire appointment on the person that they don't respect, I guess, exactly. the person they respect the least. Yes. Um, and you're and exactly so. right. And, and, you know, that whole dynamic can change. And sometimes I think um, I had someone ask me about this, actually, about is it the person or the position? And I think sometimes it's the it's the position of that 
add in person, the location. If you can have that person come to the back sometimes, it, mm-hmm. but it is what goes on at the front there is a cancellation creator. And I think we just don't always realize that's what's happening. Yeah. And I've personally seen it because I do work both in the administrative area and the clinical mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. As soon as I switch gears, if I go to the back, they feel like I know what I'm doing clinically. Um, and mm-hmm. so they mm-hmm. respect me in a different way. The patients do when I'm back there versus when I'm sitting at the front desk. They feel like all I know about is insurance if I'm sitting at the front desk, uh, maybe appointments. But if I go to the back, they're asking me more clinical questions, which makes sense. That's the people that would know that. Mm -hmm. But that's also, it just proves where they put me on the totem pole based on, even though I'm the same exact person, based on where I'm sitting and what I'm doing at that moment. That's exactly right. That's exactly not really my knowledge. Well, another thing about building value, because that's where we are right here in Mm -hmm. Singapore, is is, you know, this is another thing I hear all the time. I'll ask clinical team members, well, how can we build value in uh, the patient's uh, understanding of what's going on and prevent this cancellation? Because preventing cancellations is really the ticket. Uh, yeah. That's where our power is, is preventing the cancellation, not trying to handle it when it happens. Sometimes it's too late. And yes, there are tools for that, but um, one of the biggest answers I get, Shelly, is, well, we just need to educate the patient. They just need a lot of education. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably know what I'm going to say. What, what, what are your thoughts about, oh, well, we just need to educate? Well, if we were educating, um, then we would not have physicians who were overweight and smoking. <laughs> yes. And I know you use that one a lot, but it's true. It's I mean, true. You can't just shove information down somebody if they don't believe it and they don't value it mm-hmm. um, personally. And they might understand it, but do they actually care um, and value that information? If they don't, there's not anything that you can tell them that's going to work. I mean, that's exactly you know, right. That's like, you know, we have seven seconds before we lose their attention and we have to pay attention if we're lecturing or not. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's, I know a lot of team members get passionate like about perio or implants or something and, and they have their spill. And what happens is, is we're going on and on about it and the patient's sitting there going like, you got me confused with somebody who cares about that. You know, exactly. Um, Keeping them involved, that goes back to that involving your patient and that's in the education aspect as well of, do you have any questions about this? What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. All of those different questions that we throw out there to involve them because Mm -hmm. that's going to help you to pick up on, okay, have I lost them? You may have lost them at, yeah, we can put an implant in here. And then, <laughs> then they started like, thinking of surgery, I'm done. different kind of implants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, I think one of the things that I've been saying lately, it's kind of been a catchphrase, is we have to know the patient's motivation before we start our education. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to knowing what the patient's goals are what their hot buttons are, um, and then we connect everything that they need to what they said they wanted, and we become their partner instead right. of pushing. Exactly. Uh, and that comes back to that relationship that you've built before you ever yeah. even started this clinical exam. That's exactly right. And most people don't want to take the time to ask the patient what their goals are um, mm-hmm. they say, well, a lot of the patients don't know what to say. Well, that goes back to your personality profiles. Some of your introverts may not know what to say. Your extrovert, extroverts will be more talkative. But then that's where we have to pull out our questions like, you know, are you happy with your smile? Are you happy with the shape of your teeth? Are, do you have any crowding that's bothering you? Do you like your black fillings? Do you have any spaces in your smile that you don't like? I mean, you have to lead the witness, you know, Uh, give them some samples. And then when they say, well, you know, I really don't like the color of my teeth and I never have liked this little space right here. um, We would have probably never brought that up, but they did. So it bothers Mm -hmm. them. Um, 
you know, so then we begin to connect. Well, you know what? I can see why you have that space in between those two front teeth right there that you don't like. I see some other things going on back here that could be causing that. Would you like to know more about it? Now we've got their attention. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's related to everything they said they wanted. Um, and then we were their partner, their friend, exactly. and it builds trust. So anything else about building value that we can add to this? I think we've covered a lot of it. I, I feel like we've covered a lot of that as well. So it kind of starts to lean us into now we're going to recommend the treatment. And we kind of um, alluded to that when we were talking about the transfer earlier. Yep. So mm-hmm. um, it's all in you're not necessarily avoiding the fact that, yes, they need a crown or, yes, they need a root canal, but the way that you present it is <laughs> is huge in that you're not necessarily just saying, we're, next, we need to take care of that crown. You're, we're going to repair the cracked tooth or um, instead of we're going to do some fillings, um, they're thinking money in that aspect versus we're going to take care of the cavities and remove those cavities to get these teeth nice and healthy again. Yes. Um, and so you're going back to the value aspect in their treatment. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So scaling and root planing. Who wants to be scaled and root planed? I, I haven't met <laughs> anybody yet. <laughs> and then probed. <laughs> exactly. But they would much rather take care of their gum disease. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are familiar with that terminology and it's something <laughs> that um, I feel like if you have to try to come up with a word that they would understand for gum disease, that's that tends to be a tricky one for me. Um, coming up with something other than periodontal disease <laughs> or um, uh, infection removal. Yes. Infection. They don't think of it as infection because it's not necessarily hurting them. Um, detox. So what if we call it detox? Detox is detox. the best word right now. <laughs> detox your teeth. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> That's a good one. I'll write that one down. Yeah. Um, root canals. Nobody likes to sign up for a root canal, but they would like to remove infection. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. And so using those terminology, that terminology versus the actual treatment. Yes, it's on the treatment plan. Yes, um, your form that you're going to have them sign to get commitment is going to say what you're doing, but mm-hmm. it's okay to maybe write, we're going to remove the infection in this area or something on there so that they remember what they're actually coming for mm-hmm. and why they're coming, not just what I should, I guess I should say what they're coming to get taken care of versus what they're coming to do. Yeah, exactly. And that goes back to features and benefits. Uh, yes. The features are the treatment words and the benefits are what this is going to do for them. And that's, that's the, what's in it for me, mm-hmm. you know, um, what's in it for the dental practice is we get to do treatment. What's in it for the patient is they get the benefit of that treatment. Exactly. And they get a healthy mouth or a healthy tooth. Exactly. Uh, they don't care about the treatment words. In fact, that can create cancellations when we're talking dental language or these treatment words and they may not understand we think they understand we use a lot of abbreviations in dentistry Mm -hmm. and they don't know what that is and then they get home and go you know i don't really know what i'm having done and why i'm having done having this done and why i need to come back every three months and um so you know and and why is it going to cost this much money i think i won't go right so that's kind of the thought process that goes on in their mind. I think the the 4910, the perio maintenance visit, is one of the hardest to get back. Um, yeah. And that's that's why I would highly recommend using that, going back to the intraoral camera yes, yes. and showing them what has occurred over the last 90 days or 120 mm-hmm. days if you're doing four months so that they can see, oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's probably not normal to have all of that build up right there. Yeah. And then after she's done, she gets that taken off and then they come back in another three months and it's right back there again. Um, and they feel like they're doing their due diligence at home. But it's just unfortunately, it's just not enough mm-hmm. um, to really to get in there and keep those areas clean, which we know. But toothpaste companies decided that everybody sh- and insurance companies decided everybody should come every six months. So that's what the patients know because that's what's out there. But um, we know clinically that's not necessarily 
in their best interest if they're looking at the overall health. So Exactly. I mean, that's um, it's ridiculous that our toothpaste companies came up with that and we're mm-hmm. still stuck on it. And then the insurance companies picked up on it and all that kind of thing. So I think the other thing about building value, and I'm going to step back to that for just a second, is mm-hmm. that if we have really built value and in the presentation of treatment, built value and the benefits of the treatment, the insurance payment, what the insurance is going to pay can become less of a factor because yeah. now we know what their goals are, what they want more than anything. And I think, you know, in this country, if we want something bad enough, we get it. Exactly. We figure <laughs> out a way. So that's really, the insurance is not our problem. It's getting the patient to want it. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I do hear a lot of people say, oh, well, yeah, they can afford it. They're walking around with an iPhone or they're walking around with this or that. Yeah, you're right, because they valued that. They felt like they really wanted it. Bingo. And so they made it happen. And so if you're feeling that way about your patient and giving that kind of thought process of, yeah, they're saying it's money, but um, mm-hmm. they have this, that that should be your key right there that exactly. you might not have built the value quite the way that we had intended um, so that's where we need to look back at our case presentation and how are we actually involving our patient in that process. And if we know they're really engaged and they want this, they see the seriousness of their condition, um, this is definitely not their goal for their mouth to have this continue. And then the insurance comes up, we can confidently say without being cocky, you know, if your insurance isn't going to cover this, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. And and we have more of a likelihood of that not becoming a barrier. So, um, you know, I think this is this is valuable information on preventing these five steps here, uh, five categories of preventing a cancellation. Was really our goal today was to spend most of our time on preventing the cancellation. Now, the call uh, obviously the calls do come in. Um, you know. One of the biggest things about the cancellation call that I hear, because admin teams are busy, is they say, um, you know, patient calls in and says, well, I'm not going to be able to make my appointment. And they go, oh, okay. okay. Do you like to reschedule? <laughs> and we think just. Well, sometimes they don't even ask that. <laughs> they don't even ask, do you want to reschedule? That's just. Ah. Oh, because we're busy and we're distracted and we're multitasking. And I've been mm-hmm. up there. I know how that is. It's very frustrating and stressful all day long. Mm-hmm. So exactly. what, do you, what do you guys say, Shelly? Well, first, just to kind of back up one step. So you've done all of this hard work clinically. Document it. Please, 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 because this yes. sets us up yes. um, for the admin call when that call does come in, mm-hmm. for them to be able to quickly find the information that you built so much you've taken so much time and built that value with the patient if if it's not documented somewhere as far as what they wanted why they wanted it and why they had to come back yep um it's very very hard for us to keep your appointments (laughs) in your schedule if that's not there so um i guess i'm speaking to the clinical team right there but for the admin team now you've got that phone call and first off, you want to make sure they're okay because we know that it's not okay for them to cancel. So, right. oh, my gosh, are you okay? Um, or, oh, no, is everything okay? And you're just, you're, yeah. you need to be sincere about it. But yes, you want to make sure that they're okay. And if they're not okay and they're headed to the hospital or something has happened, yeah, okay, we'll give you a call in a week or yeah. take care of yourself. You know, don't push it at that particular yeah, moment. Exactly. Let it go. Um, but at the same time, if they're saying, yeah, I had a work meeting, oh, man, that must be a really important meeting. Hold on just one moment and let me pull out your chart. And you put them on hold yes. while you go back and you look up these um, different things that the clinical team has worked yeah. so hard to work on so that you're ready to go when you pick up that phone. And this and is say, wow. this is so important right here, <laughs> Shelly. And this is where most team members tell me, uh, no, I'm not really putting them on hold. I'm not really looking that up. You know, I'm busy. I don't have time to do that. Um, But you're not going to have a chance of saving it. They just rather say, well, it's going to be six months before I can see you or we're going to charge you a fee. Those can be motivators, but wouldn't you rather them be motivated by what their condition is instead of the threat of a fee or the threat of I can't get you back in for a while? 
Exactly. So if they said, um, well, I can't get out of work today and you put them on hold and you come back and you say, oh, man, they must it must be really important that you're not able to leave work today because I know that this infection on the upper right was bothering you last mm-hmm. time that you were in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that that's likely to come back. He put you on an antibiotic and it's probably feeling a little bit better right now. But we do know it's going to it's going to hurt again. The next time I can get you in for that is. Two yeah. weeks out, are you sure there's no way you can make that appointment today or yes. tomorrow? Yes. Um, that comes across much better than saying mm-hmm. it's going to be a month. Yeah, and exactly. And not letting them know what, how that's going to affect them. Well, that goes back to relationship and the natural law of research of where we are connecting with that patient on their specific situation. Mm-hmm. And they need to hear that. And um, I think... If we don't have that information or if I would get this, well, the hygienist said I was looking good and she said, you know, see you in six months. So um, why should I believe you, admin person, that, <laughs> that this is urgent for me to come back in um, when she said I was looking good? It won't hurt me to wait. So yeah. if that's what we're saying, then we're really making it difficult for your admin team to try to save this. Yes. For the hygiene one that I've actually done <laughs> before, and it's kind of taken it to the next step. So you may want to try it. You may not. depends on how bad your cancellations are. But when you put them on hold, then to say, you know, you read your notes and then you say, okay, I just went and talked to her and I know she was really worried about that upper left. Are you sure there's no way that you can make it today? Because I know you guys have been working really hard in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, She said that she had planned to evaluate that today and adding in another couple of weeks could make a big difference um, or will make a big difference. There you Um, go. Those little words. But um, that way they feel like, oh, my gosh, she just went and talked to Betty. <laughs> and now Betty yeah. knows I'm not coming. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And so you're not necessarily taking that extra step of walking back to the clinical area and sticking no. your head in and saying so-and-so is canceling. Um, but you're no. just letting them believe that you've had that conversation because Betty does know that that person was in their schedule today. And she does know what they were planning on doing. Um, but because Betty did such a great job with her notes, all you have to do is open that chart, look That's at right. the last note, and you know exactly what reason mm-hmm. she gave them to come back mm-hmm. for that reason to return. That's that's great. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of teams are recording their calls. These are great practice tools mm-hmm. when you are we've got cancellations coming in. Mastermind with your fellow team members. Of, man, how could we have saved that, taking some of these tips? And mm-hmm. um, texting is, like, the number one way to reach your patients. We have... We, we sort of need to wrap up here today. Maybe we can uh, go further or people can contact can contact us for more information. But the um, confirmations these days, texting is like the number one way. Is that so for you guys, Shelly? Yeah, we use the combination. Um, if we don't hear back from them, then we do default to the phone call because we yeah. want to make sure that we've contacted them. That's good. Um, but, yes. The text emails um, tend to be the top, and then you default to the phone, and the mail is kind of not really happening anymore in, yeah. in most offices anymore, um, just because nobody pays much attention to their mail anymore. <laughs> most people, they're, they're if they're like me, they stand over the recycling bin and are kind of sorting, you know. <laughs> yes, like, okay, that's a bill. I'll keep that one. Junk, yeah. junk, junk. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is this has been great. There's a lot of information here for teams. Great team meeting material. Uh, Mm -hmm. Take each of the sections and pick them apart and discuss and mastermind. Ask the team to come uh, prepared with things to share. So um, uh, so I've had on the call with me Shelly Van Epps, who's my fellow coach, and she's an awesome team leader and very good at pretty much most of the positions in a dental office. She's been uh, very effective in some of the things that she's done with other teams and her team. And and this is Paula Harris, and the website is paulaharriscoaching.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have questions. I know there's a lot of you out there that will have specific questions for your office. So um, be in touch. I will post... um, 
the uh, phone number website on the link when I send it out. So feel free to be in touch with us and we'll be glad to help you. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you. It was, it was fun. <laughs> All right. We'll talk with everyone soon. Have a great right. week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.